Thanks for joining us today and welcome. In this month's video, I'd like to visit Woodland Park, Colorado. This town is so steeped in forgotten history that I will likely revisit it a few times. That said, today's tales about a piece of property that barely missed Walmart's wrecking ball and how some of the world's earliest skiing enthusiasts. I am focusing on a piece of land that was sold in 2005 to Roger Thompson of the Walmart Real Estate Corporation. His intention was to develop a low-end department store combined with a grocery store. This news sparked community outrage over fears that the store would eclipse Main Street businesses, damage historical property, and destroy the city's small-town quality of life. That April, town hall meetings were a roar with accusations, preservation concerns, and conflicts of interest. They pointed to the fact that the city voters had already voted in 1988 to not allow the town council to build city-funded infrastructure. This infrastructure was designed to entice Walmart into opening a store in Woodland Park. The difference between 1988 and 2005 is Teller County's population nearly doubled in those 17 years. With so much growth, Walmart no longer needed incentives to be interested in opening up shop. Arguably, Walmart did not wreak all of the havoc that people feared, but the list of businesses that closed, opened, and closed again since Walmart opened is too large to keep up with. It's a safe bet to say that the small business market in Woodland Park became more volatile. But as a whole, the town seems better off with a Walmart and its tax revenue. The town hall discussions concerning Walmart was where we first learned of the land's historic significance. In response to these and many other concerns, Walmart assured the people of Woodland Park that they would preserve historic buildings, set aside 37% of the land for open space, pave the Cristola Trail, and create a bronze sculpture of a local hero. As soon as the development was approved by the city council, the land and project was transferred to private developers, and no one heard from Roger Thompson again. These private developers only followed through with two of Roger's promises, or Walmart's promises. They preserved the historic buildings on the land and paved less than a mile of the Cristola Trail. The buildings that were spared served many uses during their time. The most obvious is that they were used as some sort of ranch, likely during the 1800s. What's not so obvious is they were once the hub of Southern Colorado skiing and was the home to the first ski club west of the Mississippi River. The Silver Spruce Ski Club was one of three ski areas developed by Don Laurie and the buildings that remain were once used as a warming house for Don's crew. Don was a pioneer of the sport of skiing and eventually became the president of the Silver Spruce Ski Club. Don developed ski areas with the help of volunteers and he funded this with the little donations they could put together. This was demanding physical labor that was done in the heat of summer. Laurie was quoted in the book, Lost Ski Areas of Colorado saying, back then the ski club built all of the areas with donations and with volunteer labor. We never had any money and we had to improvise and make do. We worked hard and we ski hard and we had a wonderful time. This time skiing was considered somewhat barbaric and was not widely accepted in the United States. Nonetheless, Don encouraged people to try the sport and coached people to enter tournaments around Colorado. In addition to being a mentor to new skiers, he also participated as a competitor in cross country and jumping events. Some of these events were said to have drawn up to 800 people. The competitions evolved into a great fundraising opportunity for many of the local ski clubs. In 1929, Don implemented a plan to reduce the ski club membership fees in order to make skiing available to more people. Also at this time, he merged his club with the U.S. Western Amateur Ski Association. This incorporation literally brought busloads of people who were interested in skiing to the Edlow Course in Woodland Park. By 1936, Don's incorporation of local ski clubs had grown out of its cross-country skiing roots and evolved into a club that was more focused on downhill and slalom skiing. The new focus of the club and the larger group brought with it a new name, the Pikes Peak Ski Club. That same year, he adapted an old Whippet automobile engine into a mechanical tow rope to help people up the hills. This made it so that people could get up the hills without buses or hiking. More interestingly, it was the first of its kind tow rope that was widely mimicked in the Western United States. In 1948, Don had become the Pikes Peak Highway Administrator, 
he decided to find new ski areas that would be less windy and have more shade. With his army weasel, he scouted the north-facing slope on Pikes Peak. This slope would later become known as Elk Park Winter Sports Area, but it was better known as the Pikes Peak Ski Area. The ski run was originally cleared by the highway road crew, but only when they could take time away from their normal responsibilities. It was eventually completed by the help of volunteers from the local military base, Fort Carson, and students from Colorado College. These hardy volunteers spent most summer weekends working on their ski runs. By night, they would sleep under the stars with just a sleeping bag. Similar to the Woodland Park ski run, a warming house was used. However, in this instance, it was an old CCC building that was moved to the base of the new ski run. In 1854, skiing was finally authorized at Elk Park. Don had created a fun and affordable ski destination. All people needed was skis, a dollar toll for the highway, and an additional fee to use the tow rope. People flocked from the nearby cities to enjoy an affordable afternoon skiing. Don then went on to be influential in the formation of the nonprofit Pikes Peak Ski Corporation. This charity was used to finance improvements to the ski areas for many years to come. In fact, Don served on the board of directors of this organization up until the mid-60s. Pikes Peak became the major ski area for Colorado Springs for many years. The ski area was very small compared to runs in places like Vail or Keystone, Colorado. In the early 1980s, they added a $700,000 triple chair made by Poma USA. Poma provided new terrain above the timberline or above the trees, but snow is really hard to come by in this area of Colorado. The trails were often windblown and packed. After the lift was put in, the ski area had a terrible season with very little turnout. Subsequently, it was not able to pay its taxes or pay Poma USA for their newly installed chairlift. Skiing on Pikes Peak or America's Mountain continued until the mid 1980s. By this time, the operation had become increasingly expensive to maintain. This is because all the snow was man-made or shipped down from higher elevations. The city of Colorado Springs purchased the property for a brief period, but it was promptly determined to be too expensive and was sold again to Vail Resorts. The lack of snow and increased cost made it a bad investment. Vail Resorts took the opportunity to close the ski area after the 1984 season. Not only did they close down their competition, but they also closed the chapter of US history about skiing in Southern Colorado. That was an iconic park to have closed. However, the heyday of Pikes Peak organized skiing took place in Glen Clove and Woodland Park. These were the sites that Don and his friends chose before Elk Park grew into a skiing destination. Heck, it was before Colorado was considered a ski destination. Mr. Lowry's grand ideas never wavered, and he was fortunate to have seen many of them become a reality. Don died in 2000 and was long retired by then, but it was his dreams and ambitions that helped to create the ski scene in Colorado and the Western United States. He brought the skiing industry to life before it boomed at higher elevations in well-known towns like Aspen, Vail, or Telluride. Don's grandson, Don Sanborn, was quoted in the Colorado Springs Gazette in regards to his grandfather, saying, even in his 90s, he still harbored a dream of starting a ski area, like at some hill behind Walmart in Woodland Park. We told him, you need to see what ski areas are really like now. Well, Don was likely well aware of what a modern ski resort had become. He longed for a more simple and pure vision of his sport. And to some degree, we can all understand that. To Don, this wasn't an unreasonable idea, especially when you consider that behind this Walmart was where he helped to make one of the first ski runs in Colorado. This is why I propose that the Woodland Park Walmart follow through with its promise to build a bronze statue by erecting a statue of Don Lowry and the Silver Spring Ski Club. Thank you.